Well, hello there, and welcome to the first of many Eurovision interviews that I'm going to be doing in the next little while. And I thought I'd start it off with a bang and probably the best one, because this guy is the man who's won three times in the Eurovision. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Johnny Logan. How are you doing today? Hello, Jack. No, yeah. like sort of, God, you've grown up since I last saw you. Yeah. <laughs> Which is only a few months ago. Uh, yeah, no, but like I said, I remember you when you were a lot smaller. Do you? you know? Yeah, yeah, this is that, because I, I, I knew your mother when she was with, um, your, your, fa your grandfather was, uh, I was his apprentice electrician. I was just going to talk to you a little 70s. bit about that. But go ahead. How did that happen? Where you, because you were an electrician originally, and for well, some reason, I never my granddad's. Made, yeah, I never actually made it to be an electrician. I was an apprentice <laughs> for four and a half, almost five years. Mm -hmm. And then I quit to go into the music full time. But I was always, your father, will, your grandfather will tell you, I was always, uh, I used to go to go to work with a guitar case and the tool case. Mm -hmm. and the guitar got more work than the, the tool case, you know. Because <laughs> I was speaking to him a little, like, um, ye yesterday, I was asking him, you know, oh, I watched Johnny Logan, like, as an electrician. He thought you were brilliant. I was shit. I was really <laughs> shit. Oh, this is, you know, like, uh, I worked in Arbor Hill. I said, it's one of your fathers didn't kill me. Like, sort of, I, was, I think I was useful to him in Arbor Hill when we worked together because uh, I wasn't bad at football and like sort of he used to like to stay at the front you know, and he'd try and get me to pass in the ball. You'd always pass in the ball as, as, as often as you could because then yeah. he'd be happier after the lunch break, you know? <laughs> well, that's, that's mad. That's, I find it mad though that you had well, that this, connection no, with this him is, the, the thing right? was that uh, um, I was academically useless. I hated school. I was no, no good in school. And, uh, I, went to, I went to New Zealand with my father when I was 14 and I was there for three months uh, while he was working. My father was a singer and Irish tenor. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of realized when I got out of the situation I was in Ireland, when I, you know, that I wasn't learning anything in school, yeah, yeah, yeah. that I did need some sort of an education. So when I went back to Ireland, I got my group cert. I went to the technical college. Mm -hmm. And I ended up then thinking like, what am I gonna do? And the, in those days, the the, being an electrician was like the closest thing to a trade to having been a doctor or something like this. It was the, uh, the elite kind of trade to take. So I thought I'd take this, uh, and I thought like sort of, um, I'd be good at it, and I was absolutely shit. I was really <laughs> awful. I mean, I was strong. I was good yeah. and I was big, and I was, I was able to pull cables, and he used to call me the long fella, when they were, along with a lot of other names, which I won't bring up. But, um, you know, I played uh, to subsidize, to supplement the work, because apprentice electricians got paid nothing in those days. My yeah, first yeah. fee for the first year of being an apprentice electrician was four pound, 12 pence a week. Oh, which right. was nothing even then. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And, um, and, uh, and you, the abuse you got as an apprentice in those days was terrible. Mm -hmm. But as I, more and more years, the money improved a bit. But uh, I spent all my time, um, most, of, most of my income was done by life by playing guitar in Irish pubs and things mm -hmm. like that. And in nightclubs, you know, doing uh, cabaret and yeah. also playing with bands in places like the Bagot Inn and all that sort of stuff. So how did you actually get into music then? Did you sort of fall well, into it by accident? No, with it's just your... my, my, my brother Mick, uh, I don't remember, you know, like, I was just always able to sing, Jack, and I don't mean this with, like, from an ego point of view. I was, always, I was a much better singer than I was anything else, mm -hmm. you know, and... Um, my you were naturally Mick, born with it. Yeah, yeah, it was a gift that, that I've had all my life. And mm -hmm. my brother Mick was playing with a blues band in Drada called, and he was 16 at the time. Um, and he was playing with a band called Bernard Jenkins. Mm -hmm. And uh, a band, a show band, asked him to be the singer with the show band. The show band was called The Dawn. Okay. And uh, he didn't want to leave Bernard Jenkins, so he said, ask my brother. So they asked me, and I became the singer with the show band at the age of 14. Oh, they right. only wanted me to sing, you know, five or six songs or whatever I sang. 25 or 624, I remember, by sort of Chicago and uh, what was it All Right Now by Free and things like this. And, um, but that was my first real taste of being a front man. And, uh, but it was down to my brother Mick. And, um, but I always had a, an interest in music. I like sort of, it's like everything that I did, whatever I did, music was, you know, it was always part of my life. Yeah. And uh, uh, when I played it, there was a band I played with in the eight, when I was 18 years old called The Giants. Mm -hmm. And with, with Rob Strong, a guy called Rob Strong was the singer and bass player, and he was an amazing singer, still is, amazing bass player. And myself and my brother Mick joined the band with Brian Harris, and the drummer was called Danny O'Keefe. Danny went on to become my best friend, you know, for many, many, still is to this day. And Danny played with Dickie, I think, for 20, Dickie Rock for 20 odd years. Mm -hmm. But uh, Danny um, was asked to play in a musical in the pit in, with, the, with the orchestra. 
the band for uh, a thing called Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. And uh, Colin Wilkinson was playing the devil in that, C.T. Wilkinson. And uh, I was a big fan of Colin. I'd seen him in Judas and Jesus Christ Superstar. And the, to cut a long story short, Danny couldn't do the gig, but Alan D, who wrote the musical, said, we're still looking for someone to play Adam. We've got mm -hmm. the devil, which was Colin Wilkinson, and Eve, which was Annie Kavanagh coming up from London. And uh, I went along and I sang a song called Send In The Clowns as my audition. Mm -hmm. Played the guitar and I sang it. And halfway through the song, they said, we want you. And I got a three month, I got a three minute, three month. Uh, they let me out of being an electrician for three months, gave me a pass out for three months. Oh, nice. Didn't pay me or anything like this, but they gave me a just a, you know, I was allowed to stop studying to be, you know, to yeah, yeah. pause my career. Yeah, yeah. Sabbatical. Yeah. Just pause my career, which is what you say. <laughs> my my would be career. And I went into the musical thing and I was kind of an overnight success. Hmm. And then, uh, that just and then a few few years later i got the name johnny logan the rest is history i want to ask you about that because a lot of people some some people probably don't know that actually your name is sean sherrods mm. but somehow that changed to johnny logan so how did that change well, where first your name of all it became... was sean o'hagan because my father was patrick o'hagan all right and mick and me were the o'hagan brothers band and um, that was during column the, the adam and eve thing um but then uh there was a very famous producer at that time called Roberto De Nova, and Roberto used to do a guy called uh, Joe Dolan. Oh, yes. And he, he was very successful with Joe Dolan, and all of the artists, middle of the road artists, were trying to get with Umberto, and Umberto had a choice of all the artists. And he came to see me with a record company with Rich Records in, uh, in a gig in Dublin, I think Barry's Hotel, and uh, he took one look at me and he said, I want him, That's his, and that is Johnny Logan. That, and that's where the name came from. So he and just I, gave it to you? Yeah, you know, he had, he had that name in his mind and he said it sounded like a pop star to And uh, he had a vision of me and where he wanted to go with me. Um, and uh, it was very early in my career. I was only 20 years old, 19 years old, 20 or something. Yeah, young and enough. I just did, you know, you would do anything you could for your first break. And I was told if I did Johnny Logan, I got a record deal. So, huh. you know, call me Johnny. Gee, that's mad, that's mad. Yeah. So you did that first record anyway, it was the first album, was it called In London or something like that? That was an album, no, that, that was never supposed to be a record. That was, a, what happened was, um, Roberto had all these recordings. The first single I did with Roberto, which was a record, was called I'm Not In Love. Mm -hmm. No, not In Love, uh, like, I Don't Want To Be In Love. And it was kind of like a dance record from that time. It was a really nice one, even today it still stands the test of time. But all these other songs, in London he had written for me, but a lot of the other songs were songs written for people like Gloria, singers that were around at that time. And uh, they didn't like them or they didn't do a right vocal, the correct vocal on them. And he would call me in, because I could sing as high as all the women and stuff like this in those days as yeah, well. Yeah. And I'd sing him. And basically they were glorified demos. Okay. Um, but when, the Euro, when I won the Eurovision with What's Another Year, yeah. it was Sony that owned that, not Ritz. So Ritz, because they had my original recordings, got What's Another Year and Hold Me Now from Sony. And they, through European law, which was mm -hmm. against the will of the contract that they had, the, okay. the whatever deal they did with Sony, they released an album called In London with all of the songs that I'd done with Roberto. Right. And most of them, some of them were really crap. And like I said, the thing is, but the album in London came out and it came out in direct competition to the Johnny Logan album with What's Another Year and Hold Me Now. So my whole record, uh, my whole success of What's Another Year was thrown into complete chaos Jeez. at that time by, uh, Ritz, by uh, Ritz. Roberto wanted mm -hmm. to do the right thing, but the other people that were around him just saw money. And they yeah, just, yeah. And they basically screwed up my career, my recording career for that the is. 80s. You know? That's, that's a bit. We'll get we'll get a little we'll backtrack a little bit and go yep. we're back into the Eurovision thing. Yep. Because um, you got to sing on What's Another Year and uh, with my late friend Shay Healy. Yep. And I just would like to ask you, how did you actually get to meet Shamo? And what you know, how did you actually end up getting to sing? Everybody on What's got year? to meet Shay. <laughs> Shay <laughs> that's was just, for sure. You know, Shay was a living legend. He was like sort of everybody. He was a he was very um, charismatic. He was very um, eccentric. Oh yeah, uh, but very very bright, mm -hmm. and most people because of his eccentricity, and, and, and eccentricity, uh, eccentricity, didn't um, I'm starting to sound like Donald Trump, eccentricity, didn't uh, look beyond that. But um, I'd always, 
enjoyed his company. We'd met, we, we weren't friends as such, but we, we, we'd know each other. And I was down in Castle Bar, and he had a song um, with uh, Billy um, from The Freshman and, um, and Jim O'Neill, the DJ at the time. And uh, it, was, I, it was in the contest, and I was singing a song for Brian Hurley's brother mm -hmm. um, called Angeline, Angelina. Oh. Um, in that festival and um, she came up to me and said look I have a song in the national song contest if it gets through to the final I'd like you to sing it for me it's called what's another year mm -hmm. so I you know that's like it's like getting the name Johnny Logan I said yeah, yeah no problem of course I will um, Shay excuse me Mike uh, excuse me and um, then so she, I thought no more about it um, and I found out years later that the uh, the original singer they wanted to sing was Glenn Curtin wanted mm. to sing What's Another Year and Glenn didn't want it when he heard it. So I was the second choice and uh, but at the same time a guy called Bill Whelan was called in to do the yeah, arrangement yeah. and Bill Riverdance. found it. Yeah, Bill called in uh, a guy called Colin Tully who was playing with a, a, a jazz funk band in um, Ireland um, and he played sax on it. Bill wrote the intro but the middle, the, so the solo part was all Colin. We had a meeting with uh, Tom, Tom um, McGrath, who was the head of uh, the Eurovision in those days for Irish television, and Tom didn't want to get the saxophone solo because it had never been in before. No, they'd never had a solo, an, inter an instrument solo in the Eurovision. Cut long story short, Shay, myself and Bill all argued for the sax solo. Mm -hmm. We got it. And uh, through a series, because the song with Jim, Jim O'Neill was on the, on the original version. Yeah, yeah. It was a tone lower than the one with the, the, what it event, eventually ended up being. And it was a country song. And Bill took yeah, it yeah. with his arrangement way out of that. And I spent a long time, lots, a lot of the time then with Shay. I went to his house quite a few times with my guitar and we played it and deciding on the key and stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. And then I worked on the song and he told me what the song was all about so I would have a feel for it, a real feel for it. Mm -hmm. and cut a long story short. Sung the sang in the national. I sang the song in the national song contest. It won. It went on. When I arrived in The Hague, I was the third favourite, and then they got a look at me, and I disappeared out of the top ten until I won the contest on the, you know, the day I won the contest. Gee. So what did it feel like when you went over to do the Eurovision with Shame and Bill Wheel and all of them, and you ended up winning? the Eurovision in 1980. What was that like, the, the very, emotions that came well, It's very, very, you can imagine, it's like sort of, it's very hard to describe. It must be like for a football player winning the European Cup. Um, fair, fair. Well, the, 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 fair real, the, the, the thing is, it's, um, it opened every door in Europe. Mm -hmm. it, it also came with, a, with its own crosses because uh, the Eurovision is, a lot of the winners, 99% of them are one hit wonders. And uh, you know, like sort of, and it had the name. The, the winners had the name for this. Yeah. So it came with that, and it also allowed radio stations to box me as a Eurovision winner. They'd never had to look at my music outside of saying, "Here's the Eurovision winner." So, uh, it. But it went to number one every country in Europe. Um, my first initial thing winning it was just uh, shock because you can hope that you'll yeah. win it. You think you're going to win it, but winning it, and in those days, it meant a lot more than it does now. Mm -hmm. Hugely, you know, like uh, the thing was, in at those days, Ireland didn't have the success that we've that you associate with Ireland now with the artists, yeah. with the music industry, and because um, only Dana at that time had won. Dana had won it ten yeah. years before me, and yeah, they, yeah. And, and you know the the one that everybody compares us to were Abba, and the, uh, with Waterloo, and in those days, all the big artists took part in it: Cliff Richard, Lulu, all of these yeah, people yeah. in those days. So it won. Um, I celebrated my 25th birthday on top of the pops. I've been playing oh, in a band. Brilliant. I've been playing um, in one car, mm -hmm. break, a broken down car. We had to rent a car most of the time mm -hmm. to, to get to and from gigs. And there were five musicians. And um, we were just, uh, you know, playing half empty halls. And suddenly um, I was being driven in a, uh, a Bentley limo with a guy with a hat on and a Mr. Logan and and the thing is, and then I've suddenly been, you know, Top of the Pops, which was a TV show, the biggest TV show in the world in those mm -hmm. days. And on my birthday, they presented me with a birthday cake on Top of the Pops, and I sang with Paul Duffy from Duffy Circus here. Okay. And Paul played sax, and then there was a live orchestra in the room next door. Mm -hmm. Basically, my whole life was changed around, and uh, um, what I found very difficult to handle was 
people think that you know when you get overnight success like this that you lose your head yeah, you know, yeah. that you kind of lose your, your footing in the real world what I discovered is that's not what happens what happens is the people around you lose their reality because they keep thinking that you've changed because they're looking for you to change because they think what's happened to you is going to make you change and so hmm. your basic relationship with people who know you really disintegrates if they're, if they're not the best friends um, and most of the people who know you care enough to know that you haven't changed that you're just dealing with an, the world in a much different way yeah uh, but the um, a lot of the people around you uh, you lose a lot of a lot of people because um, they their attitude towards you changes rather than okay. your 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 behavior. Sure, that's interesting. I've never actually heard anyone describe that sort of thing where yeah. they become big and then not that their ego changes, but that the people around. Them. That's that's a very interesting. That's thing. true. I've not heard. No, it's true. Mm -hmm. oh, well, that's that was that was true for me. Yeah. Maybe other people have other. Ex you know, like sort of other people have different... Uh, that was in the first Eurovision. Yeah, yeah. Which I was very innocent and, you know, I went to the Eurovision. The yeah, second yeah. one was a different matter altogether. Yes, yes. So I'd like to speak a little bit about the second okay. one because the second time you went to Eurovision, you didn't win it, but you got second oh, no, with this, Terminal I, this, 3. Well, Terminal 3, uh, uh, Jack, well, like sort of Terminal 3, I was sitting in London in an airport waiting for my mother to come from uh, mm -hmm. Australia. And in those days, all the international planes came into Terminal 3. And her flight was delayed. And I was living in Twickenham at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was looking at the, the board, you know, f you know, flight on time, flight delay, yeah, and all yeah, these yeah. things. And to occupy myself, I wrote Terminal 3 uh, and um, just into a cassette player. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was waiting for my mother, and uh, then the verses I loved. But I only Dang. wrote three verses, Long Distance USA, and last time I, because yeah, it was yeah. a Long Distance USA delay, all these other things. Yeah, and I wrote the, the three verses, and um, Louis Walsh asked me about it, and he, they loved oh. it. So uh, he he said, "Can you finish it and put it in for the national song contest for me?" So I wrote a middle eight to it, and they used the middle eight as the chorus and the intro, builded the arrangement. Mm -hmm. And I never liked it. I never liked the middle eight. Never liked the chorus. I liked the verses. Thought they were great. Mm -hmm. And Louis gave it to uh, Louis asked me to give it to Linda, who were with, was with Chips at the time, with Paul Little. Right. And much to my surprise, it won the National Song Contest. And, to, you know, I went to the Eurovision, and to my shock, it was winning right up to the last vote. It was just unreal. Because I, I didn't even attend. I just went for the parties. I went to enjoy myself there. And, uh, this is, and then uh, and I met uh, the Turkish um, delegation there, and, mm -hmm. and I ended up going to Turkey the following year, living there for, uh, for f four or five months, basically. That's crazy. And then I learned more about music there yeah. in four or five months than I learnt in all the previous years. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't think that that tune was going to go anywhere? No, no, absolutely. Seconds. I didn't think it was finished. <laughs> and to this day it's not finished, but I think Linda did a great job on it. But the thing was, the song itself was never a finished song. And I've become yeah. very good friend with the Harrys who won, who won the song contest yeah, at that yeah. day. And, uh, that's, um, and it, you know, the, the reality was it was winning on the last vote. Oh, and it was nice. only because we didn't get the votes from any other country. Yeah, yeah. If we had got eight votes, it would have won. I think it was only beaten by six or seven or eight. I'm not sure. Very close, very close. Yeah. But you still got a 100% podium record. Yeah, but anyway, this is I wasn't. I was the writer in those days mm -hmm. as well. But you know, like I said, if, um, I remember Shay saying to me at the time that he thought I was going to win it, but I, I, I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. Shay was there with Linda at the oh, time. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, it, then the round came 87, and then in 85, I, could, I finally finished all the court cases in Ireland, evol revolving around management and money disappearing yeah. issues and uh, record company issues. And I got okay. back all my contracts, I had no money, and I was living in an apartment in London. And I was getting all these songs from record companies that were rubbish to sing. And so uh, <laughs> I decided to write my own songs. And I wrote two songs, and the first one was called Me and My Jealous Heart, which mm -hmm. I wrote for my brother Mick. And then the second one was Hold Me Now. And I was working with a pro yep. producer called Jeff Wesley, who had won a scholarship as a keyboard player, piano player, mm -hmm. to the uh, Royal College of Music in, in London. Mm -hmm. And he was a phenomenal piano player. Yeah. And I didn't have any money, so I said, look, I'll buy you a drink at lunch hour. I've written out a chord sheet. Will you record this onto a cassette for me? Mm -hmm. And that cassette was the cassette that went into RTE uh, two years later and was accepted for the National Song Contest. Yeah, so you wrote Hold Me Now anyway. Yep. And then you went on to perform that in 1987. Yep. 
and then you won with yeah. it a second time as a singer. Yeah, nobody How? thought it was nobody thought it was possible. Did you think it was possible? Yeah. Really? It wasn't that I thought it was possible. It's just that I didn't... It's like driving a racing car. You know how fast you can go. Oh, yeah. And I, you're really confident with the car you have. Yeah, I yeah. was really confident with Old Me Now. Um, once I won the National Song Contest, I thought it was going to be very hard for any other car, any other song to beat me in the Eurovision. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't listen to anybody else's songs. I just focused on my own song, my own arrange, my own performance. And um, I was totally... Unlike the first Eurovision, mm -hmm. I was totally focused on. I, they had to take me in my costume three times in that one week, um, and then when I won the second Eurovision, um, it was more. It was even more exciting, and it would, But it was also yeah. a very fulfilling win because yeah, yeah. it made me feel extremely proud as a songwriter as well as a singer. Yes. And it also took me out of the one-hit category. It exactly. took me into two Eurovision wins and two, and Hold Me Now became actually a bigger hit, sold more records than What's Another Year. Yeah. So it actually became, in that sense, and it was like it became an evergreen. And it's still to this yeah. day one of the songs that, like both songs, What's Another Year and Hold Me Now, people want to hear them everywhere I go in the world. Yeah, exactly. But what I'd like to ask you about that is that you mentioned there the Hold Me End Now did better than What's Another Year. Mm -hmm. And I think, for, for in the case of yourself, that's brilliant because your biggest hit is a song that you wrote yep. and you sang yourself. Wasn't with Linda Morrison, wasn't with Shamo or anyone else. Yep. It was one that you wrote and you yeah. sang. How does that feel that your biggest hit is just, one that I you don't, wrote? I never tend to look at it as, you know, I, I understand it, but, it's, but I never tend to look at it as my biggest hit. All three Eurovision wins are like children to me. I love them Fair all. Fair enough, yeah. I love all three and I love them equally. Mm -hmm. But the one, that, uh, the one that gives me the greatest sense of achievement mm -hmm. is Hold Me Now because mm -hmm. the person apart from the other artists that were in the contest and their music, the, the first person that I had to beat in the contest in 87 was me. I had to beat my fear. My Because okay. to win something, if you've been through the Eurovision once as an artist and you go back in a second time, it's much harder. Yeah. Because you see all the pitfalls and you also realise all the things that might happen if you win. So all of that is on your shoulders when you're going yeah. out to sing. And uh, I was... I did the performance and I won and sort of I'm very grateful. I don't think it was just me, I think I was lucky. I think uh, it was the right time and the song was the right song. Exactly. And all those kind of things, you know, that they happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's why they have a thing called fate and God, yeah. was look, God was shining down on me, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now I'd like to ask you a little bit about Why Me? Because you went back yep. in 1992 yep. to write Why Me and then you got Linda Martin back. Yeah. So was that like unfin was that like unfinished business no, like maternal no, three? No, absolutely not. That, you were like, was, oh. that, was, that was Louis Walsh. Again, oh, yeah, again. Was, yeah, like Louis, <laughs> He's back. Louis and myself had been friends and working partners for over seventeen years. Right. Okay. And uh, I wrote "Why Me for Me." Okay. And I played it to a. I just recorded it with Frank McNamara on piano voice. Oh yeah, yeah. And I loved it. I loved the song. I just had something for me immediately, like "Hold Me Now" when I listened to it. Yeah. I had yeah. something immediately. And I played it to uh, the record company in Germany. It was, I think it was Warner at the time I was with. Okay. And uh, the people that I was working with said, it's a beautiful song, but it'll never be a hit because it's too personal. So they didn't get it. Mm -hmm. um, so I kept the song. I said, I'm going to record it anyway at some point now in the future. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But in the meantime, Louis Walsh came back to me. Excuse me, I'm touching this microphone of yours. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, <laughs> um, I went back to... Uh, Louis called me and said, do you have anything for the Eurovision for Linda this year? I want to put her in the Eurovision, in the National Song okay. Contest. So I thought, OK, I'll see what I can do. And I tried writing songs and they all sounded very contrived, very written for the Eurovision songs. Yeah, yeah, OK. So I thought about why, why me? And I changed the lyrics. And I edited the song down to three minutes. It was four and a half, five minutes long. Oh, all right. And I edited it down to three minutes, which had to be for the Eurovision. Yeah, and, so uh, has to. And I... Um, I, there was a line in it which uh, I keep on wondering why I'm such a lucky guy, which I had to change, which is difficult, you know, because it was written from a man's point of view. And I, then I changed it to, I keep on wondering why my love shines in your eyes. It's only a, a slight change, but it worked for Linda. And then yeah. I, did, I, did a, I did it in the key Linda wanted to do it, and I recorded mm -hmm. the vocal in that. And I said with Frank, and we went to the studio, and then it won the National Song Contest. Yeah. And then the, uh, Linda asked me for advice about the Eurovision thing. And so I recorded, as I said, in her key. Mm -hmm. And then she went to the studio and I was with her 
when she began it, and then I went off and I left herself and Frank work on it. And she listened to my vocal, she covered my vocal. Yeah. And Linda is a, you know, a consummate professional. And what she did was, um, I had decided with Linda the way to finish it was not to go for a big high note, but just to whisper, why me? Yeah, yeah. As the last line in the song. And uh, I, would, that's, I was never really sure if the audience would get that, but it worked. And then I, uh, at the time, Frank wrote this bam, 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 this big intro th thing for it. I actually wanted something a little bit more Richard Marx, you know, kind of okay, like right. wherever we go in this kind of. But um, we did that, and uh, it went into the song. Louis put it into the song contest. Linda won in Cork in mm -hmm. the national. And went on to the Eurovision, and uh, the rest is history. But I knew. Yeah. I told Linda. Linda said to me, "Do you have any advice for me?" And I said, "Yeah. You listen to the song, the vocal that you've done now, the finished vocal, day and night. Even when you're sick of it, you keep on listening to it. <laughs> exactly. Because when you're on stage and you're singing it in front of all those cameras and millions of people are looking at you, panic. You may get a panic attack, and if you get oh, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, your natural instincts will take over, and you'll you'll sing it straight through." And that's what happened. And uh, Linda, to this day, when I think if you do an interview, she will tell you that I told her in the weeks, the time leading up after she did the vocal, that yeah. I said, if you do this right, this will win the Eurovision. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it did. did. It and won it did. the Eurovision. Yeah. So what did it, when, you, when that Why Me won, yep. how did that feel? Because now you've won three times. No one has ever won it three times ever since. Well, I spent how did that feel? Yeah, I spent my time at the Green Bar drinking champagne during the voting. <laughs> And I remember saying to Linda, Linda, they thought they weren't going to win after the first few votes because she wasn't picking up. I said, it's not our side of the board. Wait, you see the next side. And sure enough, the next side shot up. And afterwards, we all got really drunk that night. And I remember telling uh, Liam Miller, who was the head of RTE, I said, now, how many of these things do I have to win before you give me my own TV series in RTE? And then uh, nothing, still nothing happened after it. But I remember... Uh, the next morning, Gary Kavanagh, who was the hairdresser, Linda's hairdresser, mm -hmm. had been left in the hotel and I came down and I had a white limo yeah, waiting yeah. for me outside. And I came down with two bottles of champagne in my hand and Linda, my, uh, not Linda, Gary and myself got into the white limo, took the roof off, drove through the park in Malmo with two bottles of champagne to the airport. <laughs> and we arrived and I've, we came back and I remember saying, well, that's it, I'm done now. Because I've yeah. won it as a singer, I've won it as a singer, songwriter, and I've won it as a writer. So that's... That's the yeah. set, um, and since then, since then, I've had so many countries, not just Ireland, trying to get me to write the song, to be involved with the writing, and I've, yeah, said, yeah. I've said no on every occasion. I know I wouldn't blame you because that, that kind of leads me to a question, which I know the answer is going to be no. But like, really, after you won it three times and got a second once, would you really want to risk no. that one hundred percent podium it's no, record? It's not. It's not. I never wouldn't why, be why I, I, well, yeah. I, I know what, what's happened is, Jack, I have a very, very successful career exactly, as yeah. Johnny Logan, the artist. And this, I have my own record company, my own publishing company. And I don't work in Ireland oh, very right. often, but that's not by choice. That's yeah, because, yeah, unfortunately, my career led me out of Ireland and I established myself in Germany and in mm -hmm. Scandinavia. Germany, Austria and Switzerland, Belgium and Holland. And that's where my work, my, 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 my work developed. Yeah, yeah. And so, like I said, if you go to the work, you know, there's no point in pushing against a wall that won't give way. So, like, you exactly, know, I was yeah. dealing with the record companies here, and there was nothing, you know, my records weren't being released, they escaped. It was going so, nowhere. Going nowhere, I mean, basically, so I left. Um, nowadays, when I come in, I sell out everywhere I work, and it's yeah, completely yeah. full. It's brilliant. Which is very re rewarding for me, but at the same time, and I love Ireland, but, and I would never live outside of it, yeah. leave Ireland, and I love the Irish people, mm -hmm. but the... Um, the, uh, the, the, the record company side of things in Ireland and the managerial side of things in Ireland is not something I'm really pushed about having anything more to do with, to be honest. Yeah, fair enough. Fair and enough. as I've made my decision, I'm very successful at what I do. And so um, by taking part in the Eurovision, I'm not getting any younger, Jack, you might have noticed. And the thing is that it's uh, <laughs> to take part in the Eurovision again, I would have to give up four or five months of my life. I'm not yeah. prepared to do that. Because it's not just writing a Absolutely. song. You have to get involved with the arrangement, the production, yeah. the, um, the performance of it. And, it, and that ca carries over months, not days. And you have to be involved in every day 
every, every association, in fairness to me or whoever the artist was going to be, I would have to be focused on that, and I'm not prepared to do that. You'd have to put as much energy as you did in the Maybe previous Maybe more three. so if it was somebody else. Exactly, and, yeah. And I, I'm not prepared to do that. I have, exactly. um, I have a very, very successful recording and, and yeah. live career now, and, uh, and you know, yeah. like I said, if, I mean, I'm extremely, extremely proud of my Eurovision history, and I'm yeah. extremely proud of the success that I've had which led to the success that I've had all over Europe. But yeah. I had to fight for a lot of it, man. It exactly. wasn't just the Eurovision. A lot of doors opened, but a lot of doors closed. I yeah, had to yeah. kick down the ones that closed and fight my way through. But outside of Ireland and in other parts of Europe, you yep. have done pretty good. You did an album. Done, I think, well, <laughs> pretty yeah. good. I think, yeah. You mentioned the album. I think yeah, the one so you're talking about is the Irish Connection. I was going to speak about the, the Irish the Irish trad album that you did. Was it well, called Irish it. Man in America yeah. or something? Well, no, just it was called no. The first one was called the Irish Connection. The oh, successful right, okay. one. I was a, I had an agent in uh, Denmark in Jutland in mm -hmm. a place called Randers, and he wanted me to do this album. He'd been asking me for years, yeah. for about eight years, and finally I wasn't signed to a major label. Mm -hmm. So I said I've gotten gotten doing nothing else, and I had just given up alcohol. Okay, and I just said, okay, I'll do it. And a few years earlier, I'd had a number one album in uh, called Reach for Me in sure. with Sony in Copenhagen. It was in two thousand and one. All right. And uh, so anyway, I, I said I'm not doing anything. So I used my band and I went into a studio owned by my sound man called Thomas Becker in ne in uh, Nebo, which is near Alborg in Jutland, mm -hmm. and we recorded an album of Irish drinking songs, that's what he called it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Whiskey in the Jar, Molly Malone. I the, all, all, those, the, yeah. all the, you know, the Wild Rover, all of these, like, sort of... Uh, but what I did do, which was completely different to what the way it's done here, yeah. is I, tr I, I, except, uh, I, I made the choruses very big. Mm -hmm. You know, like in, a pop, like in pop songs, country rock songs and things yeah, like yeah, this. Exactly. I gave you that kind of tree. So all the choruses jumped out even more so than they normally would. And this is something that would not appeal to an Irish traditional market. Mm -hmm. It's a two Irish, uh, you know, like sort of people who are really into their Irish music. But what it was, was it, it made it accessible to people who are not, you know, a lot of people in, in, in who like tradition, you know, like music in general, they yeah. hate the sound of the bag, you know, the, the illin pipes. Oh. They think somebody's strangling a cat. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, yeah. and they don't understand a lot of what's going on with the traditional instruments. Yeah, yeah. But in this case, the way I recorded this, they did. And um, I did it all, and then I A&R'd it, and we mastered it in Puck Studio. Mm -hmm. and we did a video uh, in an Irish pub in, our, in Alborg, Brilliant. and um, every, all, everybody got pissed during the day we were doing it. <laughs> anyway, we put it out, and it was, we needed 12,000. We needed to sell 12,000 records to sell. There, was, there were albums in those days. Make the profit. It's anyway. over 300,000 it sold. It went <laughs> not just number one. I was getting phone calls from Paul Young, the singer of the English yeah. guy, and uh, Tony Hadley from Spandau the Ballet. They were saying, what did you do? You're in this cardboard cutouts, cutouts of you all over Scandinavia. <laughs> it, went it went double platinum. Six weeks, number one. It Brilliant. knocked Coldplay off number one in Norway. <laughs> it went to number one in Sweden. It went, in, uh, it went double platinum in Denmark as well. Uh, I was getting, lying on the beach in Spain. I was getting yeah. this phone call, said, you've just gone platinum. You're number one in uh, Norway. I said, I'm sorry? And because I had done it away from a record company, I had done it in partnership, I owned a percentage yeah. of the album. So I, there was a view, huge financial return on it. So oh, then absolutely. what I did was I, from that point on, I paid for the recordings of my own albums and I do them. And I, then I look for a record company for a release option, you know, like to find out the best deal I can get to release the albums. And that's why so few of my albums are actually on Spotify. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, I, I, I just didn't want to release them because I felt that that was very, the return from Spotify was very unfair to the artists. Yeah, I, still, I still feel that, but it's the reality of the world we live in today. So I have now started to release. Once I've managed to get all the rights back to my album, when I get them back, mm -hmm. I release the albums one at a time yeah, on yeah. my own label, Union, Union of the Heart, and um, they go out through Universal and uh, all over Europe. And there's a, there's a Johnny Logan favorite album with some of my songs on it. There'll be another one coming out soon. And yeah, I'm yeah. going to Denmark tomorrow morning to record three more songs which takes me to Gee. seven songs for the next album. Gee, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, that's, that's absolutely incredible. And another thing as well that you got to do outside of Ireland and in Europe, you got to sing live on stage with Bonnie Tyler. What the hell was that well, that's, like? Well, that's, well Bonnie was, Bonnie's a friend of mine. Oh, Bonnie really? Bonnie has been for years and so is uh, Susie Quattro. Huh. I'm, doing a, I'm doing a 
gig with Suzy Quattro. I mean, the last person from the 80s I worked with was uh, from Level 42. Oh, yeah, yeah that know. band, yeah. And, like, uh, the bass player, like, sort of, this is... <laughs> Uh, like sort of one of my heroes from the 80s mm -hmm. and I said this isn't I'm one of the nicest guys I think I've ever met it's just and a phenomenal phenomenal bass player and um, you know we just we clicked immediately I was working with the uh, the Night of the Proms Orchestra in Belgium mm -hmm. and um, on the border of Holland and um, uh, the, the what do you call it um, but I, you know the reality of it again it's I don't work in Ireland yeah, so, yeah. you know, the thing is, you don't know the people that I've worked on. I don't mean it disrespectfully, <laughs> but the thing is, I've worked, you know... No, I've, I've even if it was people in Ireland, Johnny, Tutsi, I probably wouldn't know. I, I sang, I sang, well, I sang, I performed for Pope John Paul in the Nervy Hall in, oh, lovely. in uh, the first of the Vatican albums with, Nath, with uh, Randy Crawford and with Montserrat Caballier and Gab nice. Gabriel and uh, uh, Lucia Dalla, who you would know is probably a huge, one of the biggest Italian stars, mm -hmm. and she's dead now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I also performed in England for the Queen of England on the, in the London Palladium, at the, her, live at Her Majesty's. You can only be invited to the, perform in that by the royal family. I have the official pres presentation. I've toured with the Royal Philharmonic Concert Orchestra. I've toured with nearly every orchestra in Europe. Uh, I've done the musical for Excalibur with Martin Barr from Jethro Tull playing guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan Parsons was on the same bill as me. Like it was, he played one of the characters yeah, yeah. on it. Um, I did uh, also. John Halliwell was playing saxophone from Super Trump, and Gee. Fairport Convention were part of the rhythm section. We did over thirty something shows for ten thousand people a night mm -hmm. in Germany, in Austria, and Switzerland. I played King Arthur in that in the Excalibur thing, and then um, you know, in my own concerts as well. Uh, everywhere I work. The last things I've done in Belgium, the festivals, I've had seven, eight thousand people. That's kind of the normal thing now, seven, eight thousand. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of the concerts I do, it's one to two thousand people or whatever, and um, they're all still sell out. Do you get any time off? Because it seems like you're getting uh, doing the shuffle, going everywhere. Well, you're just going Jack, tomorrow to <laughs> Jack. I'm going tomorrow morning, yeah, because uh, I have three new songs that I've written. My brother passed away in November, and uh, there was yeah, one. Sorry to I, hear, by the way. Thank you. I was, I was, um, there was one that I was writing when Shay died, I started yeah, writing it with yeah. Shea, called The Kings of Yesterday, and it was all about us growing up in the 80s, and it was only half written. When Mike Mick passed, I finished it uh, mm -hmm. in January now. And, um, and I also wrote one for him called Better World. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I have this song, and I've already got the guitars and the bass and the drums down mm -hmm. um, on these three, and uh, tomorrow I'll be in Denmark doing the lead vocals and uh, the harmonies with uh, another young lady. Yeah. We'll do We'll do the choirs after I finish the lead vocals on two of them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next day, uh, I'll be putting down keyboards. And then uh, on the 29th, the brass section come in at 10 o'clock in the morning with, from to the 10th to whatever we were recording the brass that day yeah, yeah. on the two songs. And, they're, um, and then uh, the following day, I have a concert in Kalambur in Denmark, and the following day in Helsinger. Oh my God. And then I hope to come back home for a few days on the 3rd because I'm away again on the 10th, back to Denmark, and um, it's just, and you know, it's just constantly like this. Last week I was in Vienna for the um, the uh, Lichten Dongel um, charity. I was in, two nights ago, I was in uh, just outside Stuttgart in Asbach doing a concert, mm -hmm. again sold out, and then um, uh, before this, I was in Switzerland doing a TV show <laughs> called, uh, what was it, uh, Happy Birthday. No, happy day, the, yeah, I think it was called happy, the happy birthday. You're doing so birthday. much you can't even remember no, I, it no, all. I, but I, I honestly can't. <laughs> I mean, my, my uh, last show last year, after I buried my brother the day afterwards, mm. I flew to uh, Billund and did two shows, two or three shows in Jutland, then flew to Munich. I did a show up in... I did uh, Leipzig, and then I did the Jose Carreras Christmas special. Mm -hmm. Then I did Slovenia, Graz, mm, uh, Vienna, Blankenburg, and then the last one was on the 22nd of December. I was in Berlin for F F Frank Zander, and I did the uh, I did a, ch a charity show for the homeless in the Estelle Hotel for 1,800 Jeez. homeless people, and they were the audience. And Jeez. before the concert. We took the food out, the artists, and fed them, and then after sang for them. I'd say that and was rewarding. It's very, uh, quite emotional. It's like very humbling. Yeah, yeah. But exactly. I picked up. Unfortunately, um, I wasn't looking after myself during this period, 
and I ended up getting myself a, a lung infection, which hit me the day after Christmas. And I had a fever, and I was laid out for a, for a week, and uh, the lung infection still hasn't left me properly. We're in February now. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's out of my lungs, but I still have a chair problem with my chest, so I have a... When I'm, we're finished here, I'm going to see a doctor and just get some and have them listen to my chest. And All right. I probably need some antibiotics and some steroids or something, but I'll be fine. I'd say so, yeah. Ho hopefully you'll be fine anyway. I won't. The, I don't, the alternative doesn't appeal to me at all. <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, we're kind of coming close to the end of the interview yep. now. So I'd just ha like to ask you a few little things, a little bit about, uh, little bit about Shamo and kind of things yep. that he said to me, especially regarding you, because um, the day after you did the interview in the late late with him his last interview yeah i had rang him up and we were talking about that and everything and he told me on that day that he thought that your singing had gotten better yeah. as time gone on and do you feel that your singing because yeah. i think it as well that much, your much singing better, much better. has gotten much better yeah. you listen to yourself in the 80s and like and then yeah, now but it's I just like, god almighty I the think change is so said, no jack life will do that to you as well yeah you know i now i've lived what i sing about and the thing is that it's also um I've gone past the fame part. I'm, you know, yeah, fame, yeah. fame comes and goes. You get used to it. What's important for me now is the music and the people I sing it for. I'm very and I'm yeah, more yeah. grateful. I think in, when you're younger, you kind of take a lot of things for granted. Yeah. But I've also had to work because I had a polyp on my vocal cords. I had to learn to sing again. I had to. Um, but I'm enjoying my music since I've had the success from the the Irish Connection album, the yeah. traditional one. I now do all my own productions with my producer in Denmark, Bo Larsen, and I have my musicians, my own musicians. They're all session players in Denmark. Uh, I work with a band in, a, a big band in uh, Belgium called the uh, Golden Bees Band. And um, but I work with some of the best musicians all over Europe still. And I'm, yeah. I'm constantly being asked to do different projects. Uh, and th the reason for that is that um, I've kept the level of my performance. I've brought it as high as I can, and I still yeah. I'm not prepared to stop. I still keep pushing myself to be better. Absolutely. I got an offer from um, uh, Ferdy Boland. Boland and Boland used to produce Falco, and they did. Mm -hmm. I'm, you're in the army now, and stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they're with um, Status Quo. They produced like sort of. They, they were the ones that did that song. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ferdy's wants me to be part of um, a, a supergroup in in Holland for mm -hmm. the Benelux. Uh, four artists, a bit like sort of the Travelling Willsbury, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I've said I'll do that, and that'll be later this year. We start with that. But I think also I'll probably tour again with the uh, with the Night of the Proms Orchestra. And, um, you know, I have my own tours, which are taking me into 2025. Holy moly. That. Well, t this year is com almost completely gone. And if you don't believe me, go and ask yeah. Brian Hand. He's trying <laughs> to get me in, which is to, can't do it, can't do it. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, but that's, I think I demand much more of myself. And I think also, Jack, that, uh, you know, like sort of, I grew up in a time in Ireland in the 70s where we partied all the time. Yeah, yeah. I drank very, very heavily and I did party. And, you know, there's a lot of things, but looking back through my life that I would change if I could, but they were all part of the things that shaped the person that I am today. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe it wouldn't be a good idea to change him. But the reality of it is that uh, those things have made me the artist that I am today. And I'm a lot better than I was back in the yeah, day. Yeah. And, uh, and I expect much more for myself. And exactly. I demand much more of myself for my audience as well. Yeah, yeah. And finally, was there any sort of other like great memories that you had with Shane? No, just that I know you did a few other songs. There's, there's many, well. uh, like, so there's many memories. Yeah. That some of them I can't talk about. Oh, yeah, them. no bother. But Tim... Um, Shamo was more like a brother to me. Yeah, yeah. Than a than a friend. I'm still great friends with Fanon and you know yeah, Oshin, yeah. his sons. Um, mm -hmm. I sang at uh, at um, uh, his wife's funeral, you know, um, and yeah, I sang uh, Van Morrison's. Um, what was it? Uh, her favorite song, Dimpna. Mm -hmm. uh, I sang Dim. What was it? Um, Bright side of the road. Paul, yeah, yeah. Paul Daly was playing. Sang with me, I think, did back and vocals. And all. Like, it was dancing with me and Shay at the funeral. Yeah. Like, like I said, if it was a wonderful humanitarian funeral, I think I might even like to go that way myself. But um, uh, losing Shay was like losing a part of me. And yeah. last year, we lost Colin Tully, who was yeah. the sax player. Oh, he died gee. from cancer and this sort of thing. I think uh, one of the things about Shay was something that I mentioned at the very beginning of the inter interview. Mm -hmm. A lot of people saw, couldn't see past his eccentricity. 
Yeah. And I think the thing is that Shea was incredibly bright. Oh, yeah. And he was, um, he was always fun to be around, but he was also, mm -hmm. um, he was, he was someone who would understand when other people didn't. And he was someone yeah. who you could go to for advice. Sometimes it would be wrong. Oh, yeah. You know, Shay's like yeah. said, he wasn't always 100% right. Yeah. And he could be an awful pain in the arse when it came to his own songs. <laughs> he, like, he, was, he, he haunted me with different, different songs that he wanted me to record. He was still trying to get me to sing I'm, too, I'm So Sexy while I'm like, towards the end of his life. And I just, I said, I'm not doing it, Shay. And, just, and he says, but people will understand that you're just taking the piss out of yourself. I said, I don't care. I'm not doing it. And um, <laughs> But the thing is, uh, I loved him. Yeah. I love him today, I loved him then, uh, yeah. and I love his, his family, Finan and Shannon, yeah. and Oshin, I'm in touch with Finan quite a bit. Uh, the same thing, um, all of the people, Bill Whelan, you know, yeah, this yeah. is the one, the, other, the most unsung person from the whole Eurovision experience is Bill Whelan. Yeah, none of yeah. us, none of, none of the things that happened for us, all of us in the Eurovision would have happened without Bill. And so when Bill finally went on to be acclaimed with uh, Riverdance, Riverdance, yeah, it was a, it was only uh, something like sort of fitting the world justifying itself, you know, the music yeah, yeah. business justifying itself, and like sort of he was just putting everything in order because Bill, you know, Bill brought so much to every uh, to yeah, all yeah. the things that he was involved in, and he still does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's he's family as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to speak to Bill about about his work. Yeah, he's, he was just you know, just trying lovely. to get time with him as a thing. <laughs> it's a bit, a bit a bit like me yeah, yeah. getting to this thing, you know. Yeah, but no, no. Thanks anyway for mentioning sure. all this stuff. Okay, you're very really welcome. Well, I, as I said, I loved him. I love yeah, him. Too. I love him still. Same. You know? He was just so, such a great guy to yep. work with and talk to. Well, he had, time, he had time for everybody, Jack. Oh, time, you know? absolutely. He'd be with the most famous person yeah. today, and then tomorrow he'd be with One little like story this. about Shay, that, mm, just to finish the interview, if that's yeah, okay, because I have to... Yeah, you know, absolutely. We've one been here one long little, one, one little story that you'll enjoy, um, that not many people know. I was in a... In a there was a street in London, a very famous street, where the where yeah, all yeah. the clothes stores... Where the, um, it was just off Bond Street. And uh, there was a particular shop that did, it was opposite Brown's, and people will know Brown's, it still exists in London. Yeah, yeah. And right opposite there, there was this famous shop, and it's where Liza Minnelli, all these people went to get clothes. Mm -hmm. And most of the stuff, you, you know, I couldn't afford the stuff that was in there, but I <laughs> yeah. used to go and take a look at it, and if I was enough to save up enough for a shirt or a pair of jeans, mm -hmm. you know, like so that they were just right for stage. Yeah, yeah. But the guys that were in there, it was a bit like a scene from the, uh, like so what was the Julia Roberts song, the, um, the movie that she did with Richard Gere, the Pretty Woman. All oh, right, yeah. That scene where she goes in and nobody pays any attention to her. Mm -hmm. And I was in the studio and the, the guys that were working in there couldn't be bothered looking at me, you know, Liza Minnelli had been in earlier on or whatever. And I was like, you know, look, you know, like in the cheaper section that I could look yeah, at. Yeah. And, and uh, Billy Conley walks in. And uh, they were fluffing around Billy Connolly, like sort of, oh, Billy, what, Mr. Connolly, what can we do for you? And Billy looked over and saw me. She said, Johnny, Johnny Logan. And I'd never met him before in my life. Oh, I said, Billy, nice, like said, he says, Shay Healy. I said, you're such a great friend of mine. <laughs> you know, I said, uh, and, uh, and he started talking about Shay. And the other guys that were working in the shop were like, and we talked about <laughs> Shay for about 10 minutes. And he gave me a hug yeah, and yeah. left the shop. The guys were all over me, and I <laughs> put the jeans back. I looked at and said, "Thank you very much." Oh, you, what I wanted yeah. to say: big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's a and, perfect and example. You know, that was, but that, you know, like Shay was much more well known than people yeah. think. But know, that's a perfect the, example yeah. because yeah. you know Shay yeah. would one moment be with Billy Connolly, yeah. and the next moment he spent yep. time with me. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you, know? you know, that's something that uh, you said earlier on. Like sort of this is about like sort of this. You didn't know that I did the the London Palladium. I did the Palladium about twelve times. Gee. I did top, top of the Pops about eight, nine, ten times. I can't Holy remember. Molly. I did all of these. Uh, I've sung for, as I said, some of the biggest shows in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, people about them don't know them here, and, yeah. there's, and that's not their fault. This yeah, yeah. is just the way thing, the light my life went. Yeah. But for me, what's always been important is the next job, not the last one. Absolutely. And the thing is, that's probably why I'm still around today. Absolutely. And uh, Shay had the same attitude. Yep. But Shay was very much more... Shay always wanted me to come back and work in Ireland and to be successful in Ireland because I think Shay loved me as, like, sort of in this way. And the yeah. thing is that uh, I don't think he ever understood that uh, I did what I had to do. 
not what yeah. he felt I, I had to do, but what I, what I felt I had to do. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, much as I loved him, we disagreed on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, great to speak to you anyway, Johnny, nice about to, good, all the whole good, thing. Good luck to you. Thank you very much a pleasure. for interviewing you. Um, for letting me interview you. Yep. Is there any last things you'd like to say? How would you like to plug in the own socials? Uh, I don't know what the social, what do you mean the socials? Social media. Oh, this, that's, uh, <laughs> I'm useless, Jack. This is, anybody who knows me will tell you this. Uh, just my, I know there's a Johnny Logan website and I know that I'm on Instagram, but my manager takes care of it and puts me, you know, she tells me what to do and I yeah, do yeah. these little videos and all this sort of stuff for it, but you can find me wherever you look. Just look for Johnny Logan and yeah. people who do Instagram and all those kind of things. Yes. They don't have a problem with it. Yes, there's a verified tick on your account. There is, anyway. yeah, very. There, well, the, the, you, I'll take your word for yeah, it. Yeah, the blue know. tick thing is there. So you can follow him there. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and you can follow me simply on my YouTube channel, Jack Lucas Caffrey. I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook as well, where I'll be po posting highlights of all the interviews I have done as well. So Johnny Logan, with that, I'll end it there. Okay, Thank you very much. Okay, Goodbye, yes. everybody. Bye. See you soon.